Hi, this is Captain Chaudhary. Today I am going to speak about the stability at large angles of yield. What is stability at large angle of yield? Why do we study? What we need to study? So basically there are three things to study in this. Number one, what is stability at large angles of yield? So generally what we understand from uh, the various sources, the stability at large angle of yield would mean that the value of gz at different angles of yield. Number two, why do we need it? We need it to satisfy the stability criteria, the various stability criteria. For example, damage stability criteria, intact stability criteria, the grain stability criteria, the severe wind criteria. So there are various criteria we need to satisfy. We need to demonstrate to the administration that look, we are satisfying the criteria which is relevant. The other purpose of stability at large angles of heel is basically for a master to understand that his ship stability is such and such. Chapter 2.1 of SOLAS as well as Merchant Shipping Act, they say that the stability data that is provided to the master should be such that master should be able to make an accurate assessment of the ship stability whether in damaged condition or in any of the service conditions by rapid and simple means. By rapid and simple it means the user friendly way. It shouldn't be very complicated. It shouldn't take a lot of time. So what is that you need to demonstrate the ship's stability as of a particular status? I have analyzed it to be the set of the GZ curve and relevant criteria. So uh, suppose a condition is discussed in your stability book or damaged stability book and at the end of calculation, suppose the GZ curve is given as well as the relevant criteria is given. A master is able to look at these two things. He is able to look at the GZ curve and the relevant criteria and he is able to assess what is the health of the ship. What is the status of stability of his ship. So this is what is required according to the IMO. Just by looking at the shape of the curve, he is able to generally uh, decide whether the stability health is good or not. Plus, there is a legal endorsement by the relevant criteria if they are satisfied. So, uh, suppose the GZ curve is like this. It means that the GM of the vessel is very low. If the GZ shape is like this, it means that the vessel is very stiff. The GM is very high. As well as at around 25 to 30 degrees where we actually need a stipulated amount of GM is not available in this particular curve. That the minimum GM of the ship should be at least so much and it should not be at an angle less than so much. That is because we need a reasonably good stability in the range say for example 25 to 35. Now uh, this is like a camelback. This is not accepted. You need to have a healthy shape which might be like this. Of course, this is the upright negative stability, the ship at angle of law over here and this is the listed vessel. So there are various features of the ship's stability that are apparent from the GZ curve and that would be possible if you have the stability at large angles of it. So what we understand at this moment is why we need stability at large angles of heel is basically to demonstrate various criteria number one and number two to assess the ship's health, what kind of health the ship has. Now next is how do we get stability at large angles of yield? Well, uh, number one is one-sided formula. And that is GZ is equal to GM plus half BM tan square theta, the whole thing multiplied by sine theta. Now the thing is, uh, wall-sided formula should be used only till the deck is immersion, even if it is a box vessel. For that matter, even if it is a ship-shaped vessel, and if you are talking about the load draft, at higher drafts, you might use the wall-sided formula till the deck is immersion. What is more important is the wall-sided formula should not be used beyond the decades immersion. Up to decades immersion, uh, the wall sided formula can definitely be used for box vessel and with some accuracy or with some approximation it can also be used 
for the loaded vessels. The stability information is given in the form of cross curves or KN curves. Let us look at uh, the diagram of a box vessel. What is KN? Let us try and understand in this diagram. Okay. This is the original water level W0, L0. This is the new water level W1, L1. This is the original position of B. These are the centroids of the immersed and emerged wedges. Uh, we will call them BB1. And B moves parallel to BB1 to this position B1. From B1 we draw an upright. And somewhere over here you have G. From G we draw a force vertically downwards. This is the writing lever. This point can be called as point K and if I draw a line parallel to GZ from K and then extend this line downwards, this meeting point is called N. What we are given in the stability book normally, the ship's stability books normally, is the value of KN. KN is uh, the lever. KN is a kind of writing lever for an imaginary position of G at keel. If the G could be brought to keel, then the writing lever would be KN. But G cannot be at keel as you know. But we generally have the knowledge about KG. Uh, if we consider this angle, this angle is theta, so is this angle also theta. If I call this point as P, then KP can be considered as KG sine theta. And in this diagram, you can see PN is equal to GZ. So GZ, which is equal to PN, is equal to KN minus KG sine theta. So we are given the values of KN for various displacements if you look at the ship's stability books. And from that KN what we need to subtract is KG sin theta. We invariably add free surface to KG and that becomes KG fluid. So KG fluid sin theta is subtracted from the various values of KN to get the GZ curve. Uh, here uh, an interesting formula called Atwood formula also will be learned. Uh, the diagram drawn the diagram is more or less similar. Now here is inclined vessel. This is initial water level. This is final water level. This is the initial position of B. The centroids of the buoyancy wedges, this is the emerged and emerged wedges, are called B and B1 respectively. So from the centroids of these wedges, I draw a perpendicular on the present water line, meeting the present water line at H and H1. So can I say that the BB1 is the actual displacement of the wedges, whereas HH1 is the transverse displacement of the wedges, right? Now uh, B will shift in a direction parallel and proportional to BB1. Once again, this is the writing lever GZ. If we want to find out a shift of center of buoyancy not parallel to BB1, not parallel to BB1, but parallel to HH1, that means perfectly athwart shift, shift of center of buoyancy would be this way. I will call it B2. So can I say BB2 is equal to small v that is the volume of each wedge multiplied by HH1 upon capital V that is the underwater volume. So BB2 that is from here to here is VHH1 upon capital V. Right? The formula is similar to W into D upon displacement which everybody knows. If I drop a perpendicular from G on this line BB2 meeting at say P, then can I say BP, now this angle is theta, the inclination, so can I say BP is equal to BG sin theta, opposite upon hypotenuse is sin theta, so can I say BP is equal to BG sin theta, PB2 being GZ, PB2 
B G Z is equal to B B two minus B P. That is V H H one upon capital V. V H H one upon capital V minus B G sin B. This is Atwood's formula. There are various applications of uh, knowledge of uh, stability at large angles of heat. I can list them. One is demonstration of various criteria. Number two, the shape of curve gives an idea about the health and status of the stability. Third is we can find out the amount of say grain etc shifted then we can also uh, find out what is the effect of transverse and vertical shift of the cargo now let us talk about this third point the amount of grain shifted if this is the gz curve in case of grain and suppose we get a list of say 8 degrees we measure the gz at 8 degrees gz at 8 degrees is equal to gz1 cos 8 degrees so therefore we can find out the gz1 but gz1 is equal to w into d upon displacement this is the normal formula the transfer shift of g that is gz1 is equal to w into d upon displacement but in case of grain shift whenever the grain shifts we assume that a wedge is shifted from port to starboard or starboard to port on the higher side from lower side to the higher side and the effective transfer shift of the wedge can be considered as 2 times b upon 3 so when we know the value of d as 2 times b upon 3 we know the displacement we know gz1 we can find out how much grain has shifted this is one of the applications of gz curve which we can get only if we have stability at large angles of heat